Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture by Professor Anthea Butler, spon sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm Marie Griffith, the center director, and I say this every time, but it is truly great to see all of you here in this room, and also to welcome all of you who are joining us by live stream or Zoom from home. This is our first major public event in two years, and I don't think we'll ever take gathering together for granted again. And in fact, we're so excited to gather with you that we have a surprise gift for you all at the end, uh, at least for those of you here in this room, so please stay tuned for that. We also hope you'll stay for a reception and book signing with Professor Butler, whose celebrated book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America, will be available in the lobby. Uh, we have a couple more events this semester to which I'd like to call your attention. Next Thursday evening, April 14th, we'll welcome anthropologist Kevin Lewis O'Neill on the topic, An Island Retreat, Sin, Secrecy, and the Offshoring of Sexually Abusive Priests. That will also be at 7 o'clock in this same room, as well as on Zoom. And on Tuesday, April 19th, the Danforth Center welcomes journalist Mark Oppenheimer to speak about his recent book, Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting and the Soul of a Neighborhood. Further information is available on the welcome table outside this room, as well as on our website, and we hope all of you will join us for these events as well. And now it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, Lori Maffley Kipp, to the podium to introduce our distinguished speaker. Lori is the Archer Alexander Distinguished Professor in the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, and she has served as the Director of Religious Studies, as well as the Interim Dean and Vice Provost for Graduate Education here at Wash U. Prior to joining the center, she taught for 24 years at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, she is a renowned scholar in several areas of American religious history, including African-American religious history, religion in the Western United States, and Mormonism, among others. So, Lori. Good evening. It is my distinct pleasure this evening to introduce our guest and my dear friend, Anthea Butler. Professor Butler is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor in American Social Thought and Chair of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research and writing spans African American religion and history, race, politics, evangelicalism, gender and sexuality, media, and popular culture. She's also the recipient of numerous honors and a driving force behind several important public initiatives. She was awarded a loose ACLS Fellowship for the Religion, Journalism, and International Affairs Grant in 2018-19 to investigate the prosperity gospel and politics in the American and Nigerian contexts. She was also a presidential fellow at Yale Divinity School for the 2019-2020 academic year. And currently, she co-directs the Henry Luce Foundation-funded Crossroads Project for Black Religious Histories, Communities, and Cultures. Finally, she is also the current president of the American Society of Church History, one of the oldest professional guilds in our field. Some of you may know Professor Butler more from her public engagement in social media, print, and television. She is an op-ed contributor for MSNBC, her articles have also been featured in the New York Times, The Washington Post, CNN, NBC, and The Guardian. She has served as a consultant to PBS series, including Billy Graham, The Black Church, God in America, and Amy Semple McPherson. For all her titles, titles and accolades, however, and Anthea is quite simply a force of nature and a scholar who can speak truths that cut through much of what passes for academic rhetoric. We were trying to remember earlier today just how long we had known one another and when we had met, and while neither of us could recall exactly, I believe it must have been sometime in the late 1990s when Anthea was in graduate school. 
Even at that time, she was sought after as a conversation partner because she could talk about race, religion, and politics in ways that few other people would. The woman does not mince words. She brings to her work a unique mix of deep generosity for religious communities of all stripes, a biting wit, and a willingness to hold people to account when necessary, something I have a feeling she will do with us this evening. Anthea also brings her own real life experience from very different worlds to bear. First, from her research and experience in African-American Pentecostal communities, she had intimate, intimate knowledge of the politics of black church spaces, including, I should note, wonderful, wonderful stories about female dress requirements in particular churches. That part of her life informed her first book project, Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World, in 2007. Second, from her traversing of white evangelical spaces and her deep friendships with people that live in those worlds, she brings an empathy tempered by a commitment to truth-telling. You may not always agree with Anthea, but you know exactly what she thinks. Moreover, you know that her shots are not cheap ones, but are grounded in understanding and a commitment to sustaining relationships across the political spectrum. She wants us to think better and to view our current political and religious tensions from new vantage points. She has certainly helped me to do that. Those goals are on full display in her most recent book, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America, as well as her contribution to the 1619 book, A New Beginning. And I suspect we will hear more about them tonight. But I will let you experience them for yourselves. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Professor Anthea Butler here to talk about conspiracy, evangelicals, fear, and nationalism in the 21st century. I've always wanted to sneak up from behind the stage and just pop out. It's actually really great. Honestly, we really could just leave now because um, Lori has given me this incredible welcome. And I feel like, what do I have to say, right? I don't need to say anything else. But thank you all for coming. This is like really lovely. This is the first time in two years that I have spoken to a group of people in front of me and not on you know, some kind of thing. So that's really great. I think this is making too much noise. So let me just move it. Can you turn on the, this mic instead? And then we'll go to the lab afterwards. Thank you. We don't want to hear all that scratching. And hello, everybody out there in Zoom land. This is how you're used to seeing me. You haven't seen my legs in two years. It's probably good that you haven't. So thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Marie, for inviting me. I have known these two lovely professors and women for a very long time, and they are good friends, as well as I'm friends with other people in the center, Lee Schmidt, uh, Mark Valeri, everybody from the center has just been wonderful. And I just want to talk about the center staff, Deborah especially, who've been really gracious to me. So I just want to say thank you, first of all. And then to begin, how about that? Because this is not going to be an easy talk tonight. But I think it's a talk you need to hear. And it's a talk about where we are right now. January 6, 2021 was a defining moment in American history. It was the first time that the Capitol had been stormed by a large crowd of people since 1814. While other attacks at the Capitol had happened, most notably bombings and the shooting of five congressmen in 1954, 1-6 marked the first time that attack of this magnitude occurred. And while we are still processing, at least I am anyway, what this all means for America, I want to single out a particular moment that I think encapsulates what I'll be talking with you about this evening. And that is the prayer in the Senate chamber. I'm going to play this main clip for you, and then I want to talk about its meaning and how this connects to conspiracy theories and evangelicalism today. Christ, we invoke your name. Amen. 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 Let's all say a prayer in this sacred space. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for gracing us with this opportunity. Thank you. Let me take a bite. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. For this opportunity to stand up for our God given unalienable rights. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving the inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us in this building, to allow us to exercise our rights, to allow us to send a message to all the tyrants, the communists, and the globalists that 
this is our nation, not theirs. Yes. That we will not allow the America, the American way, the United States of America to go down. Thank you, divine, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent creator God for filling this chamber with your white light of love, with your white light of harmony. Thank you for filling this chamber with patriots that love you and that love Christ. Thank you, divine, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent creator God for blessing each and every one of us here and now. Thank you, divine creator God for surrounding and filling us with the divine, omnipresent white light of love and protection, peace and harmony. Thank you for allowing the United States of America to be reborn. Thank you for allowing us to get rid of the communists, the globalists, and the traitors within our government. We love you and we thank you. In Christ's holy name. Amen. They did end with amen. I just cut it badly. The leader of this prayer, known colloquially in the news as the QAnon shaman, was Jacob Chansley, who was recently sentenced to 41 months in prison for his role in the insurrection. Said specific words in his prayer that to the normal listener would not appear to be part of a conspiracy, but they were. The words that he spoke about globalists, communists, and the like all resonate with things that we hear every day, but we might not know where they come from. His prayer is an imprecatory prayer, a prayer designed to move God to make things happen, to speak on behalf of things that he felt was evil. Commanding Jesus, according to his words, to be in the Senate chamber to fight against the tyrants, communists, and globalists. He called his fellow insurrectionist patriots. He called on the white light of love to fill the chamber. And he, like everyone else in the room, thought they had God's favor because they had successfully broken into the Capitol. Now, on one level, we know that this is all wrong. It's wrong because it was a breach of the Capitol building. People died. Politicians and staff had to be evacuated alongside the president, the vice president of the United States, all because it was the certification for John Bi Joe Biden's presidency. In no short order, people began to call this within 24 hours an attempted coup. Moreover, and this is crucial to my talk tonight, it marked the moment that prayer wasn't just a prayer, but a prayer for insurrection, a prayer for overthrow, and a prayer that sounded like an evangelical prayer, but was a mashup of several different beliefs that are held by these insurrectionists. They are held by politicians, church members, and many other people who believe conspiracy theories in America, and they are held by evangelicals. What I wanna talk about today is how evangelicalism has changed and where we are now. This is not a talk to denigrate evangelicals. This is not about trying to put them in a certain spot. This is about telling you the truth. And so while many may disagree with me, I think what we can agree on is that this is a moment for this particular movement in American religion that bodes ill, that is trouble. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book, which came out before 1-6, was because I already saw evangelicals in trouble. And I had friends that I couldn't be friends with anymore because they had decided to move into a very radical space. Their God that they prayed to was not the God that I thought we shared. But it wasn't really just about God, it was about the ways in which they thought that they were doing the right thing, but were willing to embrace things that were not legal, that were not part of civic engagement, and that were harmful. And so out of all of this, what I realized was that evangelicals, both traditional ones and cultural evangelicals, and I'll talk a little bit about that, have embraced conspiracy theories in part because of their support of Donald Trump, fear of demographic and social change, and the embrace of conspiracy theories such as Stop the Steal and QAnon. The appeals you hear from both religious figures and politicians about pedophilia, child pornography, are QAnon beliefs and talking points that have made their way into the mainstream because of disinformation, a robust, viral, and vicious media system, and the proliferation of organizations outside of local churches that have enormous social reach and political connections. While this may be all surprising to some, it is not something that happened because of the election of Donald Trump. It happened because of a longer history of conspiracy theories surrounding Christianity. Whether there was anti-Semitic tropes about eating babies, or what Catholics do and how they have a fealty to the papacy, or to the Illuminati, many evangelicals are hearing variations on these conspiracies, today from people who are not coming at them just in the church pews, but through Facebook, through Twitter, through social media channels, and through, unfortunately, the recent hearing for Katenji Brown-Jackson through the mouths of politicians. 
What's happened? Why are we in this space? We are here in this space because of the proliferation of Christian nationalism. When I was a grad student, I remember reading a book by Marco, Mar Michael Barkin, which was about you know, the rise of the racist right. And this was about the regular kinds of people that we used to think about, Stormfront, all these groups that were white identity groups that espoused some kind of Christianity. And that's true. But what has taken their place is something more dangerous, something deeper. It's sitting in the pew next to you at church. It's the person who's ringing up your groceries. It might be a friend of yours. But now you can be a Christian nationalist who believes in conspiracy theories that have no place in either the gospel or any place else. And so while I'm not here to talk about how I want to reform evangelicalism tonight, what I am here to talk about is to help you understand and hear what is being said, and also to understand the space that these, this religious group is in and people who are outside of it too. What has happened is you have a confluence of Christian nationalism. And so we have to think about what the definition is. And so I want to read a couple of definitions, and then I'm going to talk about how I said it in the book. So one of the people that I've been working with, two of them actually, are Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, both sociologists. Their definition of Christian nationalism is, at heart, Christian nationalism fights to preserve a particular kind of social order, an order in which everyone, Christians and non-Christians, native-born and immigrants, whites and minorities, men and women, recognize their proper place in society. In other words, this is about hierarchy, and about hierarchies that are not supposed to be broken, hierarchies that are important to the way that people feel both in a nostalgic sense, and most of the time this is harkened back to the 1950s, or in a way in which they believe in a biblical kind of authority, men over their wives, God over the church, and also, and this is important, certain kinds of men over other kind of people. That's one. Catherine Stewart, who is author of The Power Worshippers, says that Christian nationalism relentlessly promotes a message that the world is divided between the pure and the impure, inside and outsiders, and assures their followers that if they conform, they will be on the inside. And I think that's really important. This is about making a community, but a different kind of community. At gatherings of people who believe in Christian nationalism, loyalty is a test of truth, and supporting the right candidates is a key to the path of spiritual salvation. In other words, it's not just about receiving Jesus Christ as your savior anymore. It's about how are you going to show yourself true to the gospel if you vote for the right candidate, if you support God's candidate, or in the case of the 2016 election, the King Cyrus, who was Donald Trump. Now, in the end of my book that you will see tonight, I said that evangelicalism is not simply a religious group at all. It is a national political movement whose purpose is to support the hegemony of white Christian men over and against the flourishing of others. Now, that may sound very stark, but when I think about Christian nationalism and I think about the people who support that, no matter what color there are, they think about a certain kind of hierarchy. Men are on top of it, and it's also very political. And so while we have had years of talking about evangelicalism, from the moral majority, to Ronald Reagan, to Christian coalition, to promise keepers, to what happened after 9-11, to um, all these different people and the ascension of Donald Trump, what I think has happened is that evangelicalism is not just a simply a religious group, but it is a political movement. And we haven't wanted to talk about that. We have talked about the ways that evangelicals move throughout society to do kinds of political things. We don't want to admit that the ways in which they've used morality have been both, as I talk about in my book, as a shield to protect them from anybody thinking that they were after power, but also as a bludgeon to make sure that the public does not get out of line and that the kind of beliefs that they have are important. Now, while we can think back to a time when evangelicals used to say, oh, you know, we're going to get rid of somebody if they had sexual sin or whatever, now that's not the case. Sexual sin is not a disqualifier. None of it is a disqualifier anymore. It's a disqualifier if you're somebody else, if you're outside of the camp. But if you're inside of the camp, that's a different story altogether. The other part of this is that evangelicals have embraced conspiracy theories about race, government, money, and all of these things tie into certain kinds of evangelical beliefs. But now they are coalescing around white nationalist beliefs that threaten American democracy. So we have these kinds of messages that happen. And the kind of messages that happen that make evangelicals embrace these kinds of things 
are very important. How do we get here? What does this mean for democracy where we are in 2022 with an election coming this fall and the 2024 presidential election? I think it means several foreboarding things. One is an increase in QAnon, nationalist, and white supremacist language that is used by mainstream politicians and religious leaders alike. We heard some of this last week. We hear it from certain kinds of Republican figures all of the time, whether they're government officials, legislators, senators, others, and people who are outside of that. So that's very important. It's a realignment of educational systems in America from K through 12 to university life. We can think about this in terms of the recent things that have happened with book bannings, school board captures and others, the fights about masking in schools, and these have been very virulent kinds of things that have happened. Or we can think about the ways in which we don't talk about the nation's history anymore. I happen to have a chapter in the 1619 Project about black church, which is you know, historically straightforward, but you, know, you can't talk about slavery because that's a bad thing now. And you basically can't talk about certain kinds of historical things. We fought battles like this before, but now it's growing. You also can't say, yay, you can't do this, you can't do that. But actually, the most important one, which I won't get to tonight, but I'm happy to ask questions about, is vaccine pushback and COVID restrictions, because that's the new iteration of what is happening in terms of public health. And so what we have to ask ourselves is this question, how have evangelicals changed? Well, I think there's several reasons how they've changed. One is an embrace of conspiracy theories such as QAnon that intersect with evangelical beliefs. They intersect with beliefs about the end times. You know, evangelicals, if you are a certain age, you remember movies like Left Behind or Thief in the Night, other kinds of things where people would talk about the return of Jesus Christ, but first there was going to be a tribulation, maybe you get raptured, right? Demonic activity. This is something that is outside of evangelicalism for the most part, but I think we're going to talk about it tonight because I need to talk about Pentecostals. Child abuse, some of you are old enough to remember, and this was right before I went to um, graduate school and lived in California, the McMaster case, where you had people who thought about satanic abuse. And all of this was false, but this created a huge stir, stir within the country. And conspiracy theories about the government. The government is out to get you, they're gonna put a chip in the vaccine, all of these kinds of things. So that's one way that evangelical belief systems embrace these kinds of things. The second is the embrace of white supremacist talking points and beliefs. Critical race theory, or CRT, Black Lives Matter, repurposed from you know, a statement about trying to save black lives in terms of Black Lives Matter mean you are a terrorist or whatever, right? CRT, you know, actually, as one of my, my friends so aptly put it, is a, is a way to code somebody black. Or the biggest one, which I did not put on here right now, is being woke. And you're probably hearing this a lot. There are actually conferences for evangelicals right now about wokeness, whatever that is. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, if you have a hard time sleeping, you don't really want to be woke, right? But there you go. Um, individuality is not just about personal sin, but about how you manage the truth. Do your own research is a big thing in, in, in um, QAnon. You might have heard this about people who talk about the vaccine. I did my research. I looked at everything I needed to look at. And as a result, I've decided that it's not for me or I've decided it's for me, right? And so this idea about individualism takes on a whole new meaning. It's not just that you're an individual. You are better than the doctor. You are better than a scientist. You are better than anybody else. You're better than me. I mean, it doesn't matter that I went to school and did six years of graduate school. You know better than I do because you've read the literature. And so I started noticing this in social media like about 2011 and 2012, and I was like, what's going on? Because people would just question you know, a, a truthful fact that you put down that was historical. But it didn't matter because they had already done the research and you were wrong. This is the important one, Pentecostalizing evangelicalism. Folks, evangelicalism, as I said to um, somebody today over dinner, is not Calvin Seminary anymore. It is something else. And evangelicalism does not sit on the same kind of premises and theological premises that you would expect because they have embraced certain beliefs that come out of Pentecostalism and charismatic movements. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute in terms of an article that just came out today. These kinds of beliefs on spiritual warfare, dominionists, we're gonna take over these seven areas of power, theocratic beliefs, America doesn't need to be just a, you know, one nation under God, as you're gonna see here in a minute, but it needs to be a country that is you know, fully Christian. It does not need to be egalitarian, thinking about other religions. And it's not like you know, when everybody came over who decided, we want to get rid of the state religion from England, so you know, let's go over and be in some place that we can actually worship. No, you need to be Christian. 
authoritarianism as a Christian worldview. It's very interesting to hear the kinds of conversations about authoritarianism that tie into certain kinds of biblical beliefs and how people interpret them in order to say, you yeah, know, it's going to be okay if we have, you know, a king or emperor. But I really thought that was a thing that we were fighting about, you know, in 1776. But that's what people want now. Republican Party has turned into Republican religion. I saw this coming for a while back. And I used to tell it to people, and they would laugh at me. And I'm going, they're like, no, it's not bad. This is about money. It's about politics. I'm like, no, 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 no. They're religion. And now that they're religion, it has changed what Republicans really do and how they think and how they walk in lockstep, except for a couple of people who end up stepping out of that. And we can talk about Mitt Romney later, because I think he's, a, he's an example of every now and then stepping away to do something else. Okay, Church and state, there's no separation, folks. For them, this is together. And it's together in a certain kind of way, and it's together very importantly for them. And then finally, this is for all my folks who are either in the audience or watching right now, the Bevington quadrilateral doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because that is an assumption about thinking theologically about what it means to be an evangelical. But now what we realize is that people are not thinking about this in a theological way, they're thinking about it in a cultural or political way. And so the fact of the matter is, is they don't even know nor care. They can say that they're born again or anything else, but you know, they'll say like, yeah, I believe in the cross and all this other stuff, but I don't believe in anything else. So let me give you an example of how this misunderstanding is happening now. And it's in the New York Times today, a great article called The Growing Religious Fervor in the American Right. This is a Jesus movement. Well, yeah, it's a Jesus movement. If, you want, if you're thinking about the Jesus movement being like the 60s and early 70s. But these rituals of Christian worship are embedded in conservative rallies, you know? And this is how they have the bottom line, as praise, music, and prayer blend with political anger over vaccines in the 2020 election. Great article if you wanna just read it for what it is, but unfortunately it's not telling you the truth. The people in this article are parts of certain kinds of groups. They are people who are connected to Dominion's groups and others, and if you look at this simply as, they're just worshiping God and hoping that Donald Trump comes back, you have missed the point, you've missed the plot. And you've missed the plot because you don't hear the language that people are saying. You're not tuned to that ear. So while I respect the two authors in the New York Times, they didn't talk to anybody who does this on a regular basis. They didn't talk to the scholars and either other journalists who could tell them what they're listening to. And so I want to quote somebody who is a friend of mine today, Peter Montgomery, who works for People for the American Way. He's been watching things for this like over 25 years. He's seen all the movement. And he said, this is what's not mentioned in the article. Christian nationalism, dominionism, even though Che An, who was a pastor I knew when I was in seminary, who was involved in the Toronto Blessing, which is a whole other kind of thing you can ask me about afterwards, is quoted rattling off the seven mountains of power, which is about dominionism, the centrality of evangelicalism and Stop the Steal movement in January 6th, politics is spiritual warfare rhetoric, and the accompanying denunciation of political opponents as satanic or demonic. And this is true, we've heard this, you know, we used to hear this in the 90s about Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. This erupted again in 2016. But now anybody who disagrees with this thing is labeled as demonic. The embrace of violence as righteous. The praise music is the least of our problems, even though it is painful when subjected to hours of it at a time. Now that's Peter, because he goes to all these meetings. But here's the thing, even the praise music is militaristic. Jesus, come and take over this world. Jesus, bring your power down. Jesus, pow give, give us power. And so I wish this was just about praise music and people getting together, but let me talk to you about a praise leader who did this, Sean Foyt, who traveled around the country during coronavirus and held meetings without people who were unmasked and, and violated you know, local health laws to bring people together to worship. This isn't simply about praise music. It's about religious righteousness. It's about you know, what, we, what they believe that is the kind of thing that they should think about in terms of what the government should do for religious groups and how they felt that these boundaries broke through their religious freedom. And so while these articles will tell you this one thing and you think, man, I'm reading about this and I'm understanding it, you are not understanding it to the fullest extent that you should. And no, not, neither are the writers who are missing the plot and missing the point. Before 1-6 happened, there was a Jericho march in DC back in December. That was the setup. You had praise and worship music all day long. What is a Jericho march? For those of you who don't know your scripture, it's when Joshua went to fit the battle of Jericho, marched around seven times, and the walls came down. That Jericho march 
was the way they set up with praise and worship and preaching to get ready and to gather people up for one six. So if you think about this naively, you will miss the point about everything that is happening right underneath your nose. All right, so we got two charts here. I wanna talk about these charts just for a minute. I'm gonna kind of lean over. There's two charts. One says white Americans with warm views of Trump are more likely than those with cold views of Trump to adopt an evangelical identity between 2016 and 2020. Then the other chart talks about white Americans began identifying as evangelicals, evangelicals but then stopped doing so. You've been told a story in the press. Oh, people left evangelicalism because they were, you know, disgusted with Trump. Uh, 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 uh. That's not what happened. More of them came in, and not only did more of them come in, they started, people who were not even in evangelical churches began to call themselves evangelical because they saw what Donald Trump was doing for evangelicals. So this is serious. This is the Pew Research Center, people. This is not some made up thing. Evangelical became a different kind of appellation over these few years. It has become a political kind of thing, first of all, and secondarily, it's about white identity. If you're outside, I used to call these people when I was working on a book that I had to leave behind about Sarah Palin, I, I, I talked about these people as being NASCAR Christians. They love Jesus, they love the flag, they went to NASCAR, they watched football, they watched sports, and you know, maybe they were a C&E Christian, Christ, you know, Christmas and Easter, right? But they didn't go to anything else. And so these people came in. So while we had all these articles that said, oh, Af African-American evangelicals left, Latino evangelicals are feeling uncomfortable, you know, white evangelicals who are you know, progressive are leaving, that's a little piece. The rest of these people came flooding in because they knew that this was the place to be because they were gaining political power. The thing I like to say about this is that, unfortunately, for Democrats, Donald Trump gave evangelicals what they wanted. He paid off the bargain. He said he was gonna do things, he gave them judges, gave them judges across the country. Everything they wanted, they got. Why wouldn't they like him? And so that's the hard thing you have to hear. All right, let's look at this chart real quick. White Evangelical Identity and Church Attendance, PRRI. This is from Public Research Institute. Um, if you, and if you know Robert Jones, White Too Long book, this is who, what he has his institute. Predicted probability, white evangelical identity and church attendance. That strong line that says frequent church attenders that are going up, these are infrequent church attenders going down, but the more frequent church attenders were more likely to embrace Christian nationalism. So what's happening here? They're hearing a message. They're hearing it in these particular spaces in their churches. So one of the things I thought was always funny, and I wish we had more time, if this was a classroom kind of setting, sorry. If it was a classroom kind of setting, I would have showed a clip from First Baptist Church of Dallas, Robert Jeffers, when he, they made up for the 4th of July a whole choral rendition of Make America Great Again. You can find it online. And it's, it's great, you know, it sounds very patriotic and everything else. And this was played in the church on the 4th of July. It used to be in the church on the 4th of July that some people got uncomfortable if you just had an American flag and you played the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever. No, 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 no. He made a song off of a whole political thing for Donald Trump. That's really important. So the way in which these things are happening is that they're messages that are being reinforced, that they're hearing, that are bringing people into Christian nationalism. So you can hear people say things like 1-6, well, God called me there. You start to read the, the transcripts of people who actually ran into the Capitol, and they're like, this was Jesus. There were crosses alongside, you know, a, a whole thing where you could hang somebody. You know, so while they're breaking into the Capitol, they're also at John 3:16 signs, praying in the, you know, in the Senate chamber, all of this stuff. But these are church people. It's not people who don't go to church. There were pastors who were arrested. You know, that's a whole other talk, too. There's a great piece by Peter Manso in the Washington Post that you can go back and look for where he traces a young man who's a part of a church in Kentucky into his radicalization to the day he walks into the Capitol with a, a, you know, kind of one of these popular culture Christian certs on to wreak havoc because he believes that it's what God has called him to do. But it's not only that, it's about how people think about what they think America should be. And I wanna play this clip very quickly for you. It's about a minute. And I'll talk about it. A lot about from different people today, I think, when we talk about faith, there's something shaking. Okay, the ground underneath us is shaking. And it's shaking because, you know, I mean, there is a time, and you have to believe this, that God Almighty is like involved in this country because this is it. This is it. This is the last place on earth 
This is, this, is the, this is the shining city on the hill. This is the city on the hill. The city on the hill. The city on the hill was mentioned in Matthew. Okay, it was mentioned in Matthew. And then a guy by the name of Winthrop mentioned it again in 1630. In 1630. Okay, before the country was formed. And he also coined the term New England. We're going to go to this New England, this new world he was talking about. And he talked to the people there about this thing called the city on the hill. And then Ronald Reagan, a couple hundred years later, again, talked about it as the shining city on the hill. And, he, and they're talking about the United States of America. Talking about the United States of America, because when Matthew mentioned it in the Bible, he wasn't talking about the physical ground that he was on. He was talking about something in the distance. So if we are going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion, one one. One nation under God and one religion under God, right? All of us together, working together. I don't care what your ecumenical service is or what, you, or what you are. We have to believe that this is a moment in time where this is good versus evil. So, ladies and gentlemen. I want to stop it there. There's a lot to unpack here. But first of all, I'm just very interested in the fact that America showed up in Matthew, right? I mean, that's, that's a stretch, right? There's a little bit of a stretch that Matthew saw down the pike and it was going to be America. You know, that's number one. Number two is, I, you know, I, I really would love to have a conversation up here with Mark Valeri about how, you know, Winthrop has been used in all these different ways and City on a Hill has turned into the, the catchphrase for Reagan, but now he has repurposed it into something else, right? But then finally what he says is, you know, there's this one nation and it should be one religion and all your ecumenical stuff can go out the window. That's serious. He got in so much trouble for this. This was a huge black backlash back in November. But it's important to talk about the context that he gave the speech in. The context is he was at Cornerstone Church in Texas, which was the former church where he's retired now from John Hagee. John Hagee's son is over that church right now. And this was a whole meeting from Clay Clark's you know, Re Reawaken America tour. There's all of these tours that are happening about how to reawaken America, all this stuff. This is, a, this is a cottage industry, folks. I could walk out of here tomorrow and I could tell you that I could open up a place and make a ton of money, but that's not what I'm doing, okay? I'm just telling you about it. There were several luminaries that you'll know these voices. You'll know that my pillow CEO, Mike Lindell, was there. Um, and disgraced political operative Roger Stone was there to provide you know, the event with a legitimate dose of illegitimacy, as they said in uh, Rolling Stone. Alex Jones was there growling at the attendees that the devil's reign on this planet is coming to end and that Bill Gates and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama know that they chose Satan and they are going to fail. Okay, so here's this way in which people are being demonized and, and put in this other kind of camp, right? And then there's, you know, the, the usual let's go Brandon stuff. And then Sean Foyt, who I just told you about, was there because he just lost a, a seat, uh, a race for um, a seat in the California, um, uh, I think the legislature. He had just lost, and so he showed up at Cornerstone. Now, Cornerstone, if you don't remember, has been a big church in terms of kind of things. Back in the 2008 election, John Hagee's old tapes came out where he said God needed a hunter, and so that's why Jews were going to be killed, and John McCain had to give up his, um, the, the endorsement that Hagee had given him, and that put the church in a lot of trouble. The bigger piece about this church is that they also have, so you got to figure out how we're we doing anti-Semitism on one hand and doing Christian United for Israel, or Kufi on the other hand, which is a you know, Christian organization that works with Israel on different kinds of things and supports that. But they support it just because they believe Jesus is going to come back over there and that all these people need to get saved and become Christian. So these are, are connections that are happening for people. And you can live stream these things. You can watch them. But even more importantly, what they are doing is spreading a certain kind of message. They're instantiating this Christian nationalism. And this is happening in so many different ways that you've got to figure out where, where is this coming from. But it's not just that. It's QAnon. This is a picture from Dallas, Texas, not that far away from where John Hagee's Cornerstone Church is. You're probably thinking, this is a normal woman with Trump stuff on, where, but there's something different about that sign. What do you see? JFK Jr. Last time I checked, he died in a plane crash. But QAnon folks, and a particular branch of QAnon, believed that he was going to come back on Daily Plaza in this past November, physically. He's going to resurrect. 
and this place where we go one, we go all, that is from QAnon and this particular leader who is doing things right now called Michael Protzman. There are a group of people who are out there every day in November. They've now decamped and gone to Arizona and some other kind of places. But they haven't given this up. This is like for the American religion folks out here. This is like the Millerites standing on the hill in 1843, and then they come back in 1844, and nothing still happens, OK? But can't tell people anything. They have tons of prophecies. There are ways in which they read scripture or read these messages that come from Q, all right? QAnon is a belief that arose on the internet in 2017 from an anonymous poster on the 4chan board. I knew about 4chan because 4chan was running all these different kinds of scams and abusing women on, on social media since back in 2011, 2012. But they ramped this up and somebody who was posting from there who people sort of think they know now but they're not quite sure is this person has posted up all these different kinds of things about what was gonna happen, the coming storm. And I'll talk about some of these phrases in a minute. But this is the kind of QAnon beliefs that are not just the ones that people are receiving in the pews, but people are actually leaving their families and everything else to follow after a guy who's also known as Negative 48. He's anti-Semitic, and he has his followers to believe that JFK Jr. is gonna come back and he and Trump are gonna clean the world out of pedophiles and the secret deep state cabal. Now you're probably going, I'm really lost right now. Don't worry, most of us who try to study this are, are always scratching our heads too. But the other part of this that's really important is that regular people fall into this. They fall into it for very innocuous ways. Some of this they do because they have people who are on Instagram who post up things about this through either they're talking about yoga or other things and then they fall into a very deep space about seeing these kinds of things. You get friends, your friends and you talk about these conspiracy theories. You have these QAnon talking points and some of these talking points are now showing up with people like Ted Cruz, you know, your senator from this state. Mm-hmm, Josh Hawley. That's right, Josh. Hope you're listening tonight. Um, and others who picked up these phrases because it's really easy. There's phrases you can say that are gonna bring people into this, right? And so the ways in which this has infiltrated you know, evangelicals is really important to understand because it's not now just simply about you know, language, it's about different kinds of things. So for instance, words like you know, the deep state. People can say the deep state and say, oh, we think that Joe Biden and other politicians who are Democrats are doing a, you know, a, a deep shadow government and it's not the governance that you see. And this is about the Illuminati, which is just the same thing as old beliefs about this, okay? So, or people who follow after the rules of the pandemic. You might be sheepy. You are people who follow after everybody. The storm is a political apocalypse that will include the mass arrest of deep state figures and liberation of children that held, are held captive, okay? So there's been talk about there's tunnels underneath the White House and every place else where they're keeping children for sex abuse. Okay, or sex trafficking and all this kind of thing. Pizzagate, if you remember, the man who went to the pizza store in DC and they had targeted this place, that was part of that kind of conspiracy, okay? Or you're thinking about being red-pilled. You know, this is from The Matrix if you watch it. The red pill is the way to get Q awareness or indoctrination into Q. So this is the realization that you are liberated from all the things that people are telling you. And so while all evangelicals don't believe this, you hear these kinds of phrases about there's gonna be a coming storm or there's this other kind of deep state or there's a cabal of people in which, you know, think about this. And so you have to understand that part of this is about really deep, you know, things that are conspiracy. But then there are other conspiracies like stop the steal. Now, here's a chart. This is from Samuel Perry and Philip Gorski and I would just, you know, encourage you to look at um, their new book that's just out this coming week. And I'm sorry, I don't forget the title, so Sam, forgive me. Um, but you can look it up, it's on Amazon. And he has another great um, book with um, Andrew Whitehead, Taking America Back for God. But this thing is a predicted percentage of Americans who believe the 2020 election was stolen from Trump across Christian nationalism and race. So the big chart that is going up, 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 you know, and they have a seven item scale about how do you measure Christian nationalism are, you know, whites up here at the top, you have Hispanics, and then you have black people down here at the bottom. Obviously they're trending, they're trending a lot lower. So there are tons of people who are white who believe 
that 2020 was stolen. The moment that this started to be talked about, it was a QAnon talking point bought up by Trump and then bought up by others, you know, reinforced by a whole slew of people he had around him. And so when you hear his talks right now, he is still talking about the election was stolen. You're gonna hear something in a minute where, for some people, Joe Biden is not president, okay? And, and that does not exist. It's fake. Look at this. Major religious groups most likely to believe tenets of QAnon conspiracy. One is the government media and financial worlds are controlled by a group of Satan worshiping pedophiles who run a global platform, tra sex trafficking platform. You know, so that's blue. This green is there's a storm coming, that's QAnon, that soon will sweep away the elites in power and restore the rightful leaders. And then because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence to save our country. This is the line that should scare you, okay? So all Americans are on top. White evangelical Protestants here in the middle, 25% believe, you know, the media and everything, 26% the storm is coming, and then 24% means that we gotta resort to violence. What is interesting is that Hispanic Protestants are right up there with everybody else. Now, why is that? Lots of them are evangelicals too. And they are hearing these same messages. So while there were a whole bunch of surprise in the Democratic Party about how many Latinos voted for Trump, I'm like, you're not paying attention. You are not paying attention where people are at church. You're not pay paying attention to these major leaders who are running mega churches in places like Florida and Texas and Arizona and California who are leaders who are tied in with white evangelical leaders who are talking about the same thing. And then we have Mormons down here at the bottom, and I thought it was really interesting about Mormons, and Lori will, might want to say something about this, that they were the ones who were more willing to resort to violence than to believe the first two. So we can talk about all of this and say, oh, you know, these are just people who are just saying things or whatever, but what is happening is that our tracking and the way that sociologists and others are polling, whether that's Pew, whether that's PRRI, whether that are individual sociologists who are running polls, the fact of the matter is, is that something really deep is happening here. And something is happening that we have to pay attention to because if we don't, we're gonna miss a trick. Here's the next one. Predicted percentage of white Americans who believe various conspiracy theories across Christian nationalism. So if we look at the top here in this topmost point of the chart, the government, media, and financial worlds are controlled by Satan worshiping pedophiles, okay? Storm is coming, and then COVID. So COVID is way up here, you know? The government is hiding what it knows about the origins of COVID-19, so you imagine this whole talk about this came from China, the China virus, remember all that that happened at the beginning of, of the pandemic, all of that. There were all of these things that happened, again, pegged against the Christian nationalism scale, right? So here's the thing. All of these things are tied into QAnon, Christian nationalism, regular Christian beliefs, all coming together, all right? So what does this mean? Now this comes the hard part, okay? It means several kinds of things. Number one, what it means is that we have a very interesting scenario going into 2022 where you saw this conference that Michael Flynn was at, and I'm gonna show you somebody in a minute. What you have is a system, a, a closed system of people who are beginning to be listened to in different kinds of ways. So the kind of signaling that happened when they had the Senate hearing for the, um, you know, the Supreme Court person, for Ketanji Brown J Jackson, this is about, oh, it's not just about her, we gotta get this out as a, as a way to get our messaging out. It's something that you can hear. The regular person who didn't pay attention to this, but might have paid attention who follows Ted Cruz on Twitter or Facebook or one of those things, could hear all the crazy things that he asked her about Ibram Kendi's child, children's book about race. That book sold off the shelves, by the way. I'm like, God, I just wish one of them would send my book. I could just sell a whole bunch of books, right? <laughs> but that never happens, and this is really interesting, but that's fine. Um, so he mentioned that there, there were all these kinds of questions that were really you know, both incisive. One of the questions that really drove me crazy, and I think is worth talking about, is when Senator Lindsey Graham asked her where she went to church, how she went to church, what, you know, what her kind of beliefs were. And they did that in retaliation because that was one of the questions that came up when Amy Coney Barrett went through, you know, a year or two ago. Now, but he asked those questions in a very different way. That, the way that those questions were asked to her were about, you know, I want to find out if you're going to a black church or a white church. I want to find out what kind of church you're going to. I want to find out what kind of belief it is. Because what it does is sets up a difference. That if you're outside of this kind of evangelical worldview and you don't have the same kind of pastors or you don't have the same kind of beliefs, you are not one of us. 
you are not worthy to be here. Why, are you, why did you give these kinds of sentencing guidelines? Well, you gave those kind of sentencing guidelines because you know that's what the law says if you're a judge. You have a set of guidelines. No, 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 no. That was about pedophilia. There's all these different kinds of ways these things come out in certain kinds of ways. Let me talk to you about somebody else who has been a very big figure in the last few weeks. Uh, we got a person who has a tent set up outside of Nashville, Tennessee. He has been burning books. Not only has he been burning books, he's been casting out demons. He put somebody out of his church because he said that they were witches. But he has become a huge figure on the scene of all of this QAnon beliefs. Part of what he is preaching, and I just went blank for a minute because I forgot his name, I'm so sorry. Um, part of what he is preaching now is about this QAnon theory, but it is couched in Pentecostal things. And so there was a, a, a clip where they were asking people after the service, well, you know, do you think that this is right? And they're like, oh yes, this is all true. There are witches in our midst. There are this, there are that. And I'm like, this is like the Salem witch trials all over again. This is how you other people in order, the people who are outside of your political belief system are ideals. And so now what you have is a sense in which not only pastors are doing this, but this is happening at political rallies. So this is from the Save America rally this past weekend. Together, so we pray, Father in heaven, we firmly believe that Donald J. Trump is the current and true president of the United States. You have raised him up for this season of time to be used to be part in saving a nation. Bless and protect him and his family from any physical, spiritual attacks, and may his voice stir the people to righteous action to bring godly men and women into elected office. In Michigan and across America, we declare he will be back in office soon, very soon, in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray. We pray the fraud in the 2020 election will continue to be exposed and the election decertified in Michigan, the battleground state in our nation, in Jesus' name. Jesus is real busy right now. Now, I say that facetiously, but this was just this past Saturday, folks. I wouldn't have included this, but I saw that. I was like, I need to just like let everybody know that this is what people are praying. This is a pastor who was invited to pray before Donald Trump came on. You know, this is part of the thing. You saw everybody raising their hands and lifting up just like a service. And he still says that Trump is the president and that he's going to be back in office soon. Okay, so number one, what does that tell you? That means that probably something might happen again. I hate to say that, but it is a very high possibility that we could see another kind of you know, mini insurrection thing, but it might not be mini next time. That's number one. Number two is he is spouting basically what is this belief of QAnon, that he's gonna come back and clean up things, and he's, you know, we got this fake president right now, but that this election was a fraud. This fraud language has continued, it didn't stop. It's never stopped. And what you hear every time you even pay attention to this is that you hear, oh, Trump is still talking about this. But that's not just that. Trump and all the people who love Trump really believe this. They really do believe that this was a fraudulent election and that he's still president, but that, you know, Mar-a-Lago is the new White House and that he's still doing things. This is conspiracy theory, folks. This is, this is what he spread. And he spread it in a very deft way so that this would continue to undermine democratic processes. Now you're probably thinking, why would they wanna do that? Because honestly, people who are underneath kinds of hierarchical systems don't really want democracy in that way. They don't want democracy. They, they want a way that the world is ordered. They want certainty. And a lot of what has happened in evangelical history is about, not just about theology or about you know, great things and all that, it's been about certainty. How can we be certain we're going to heaven? How can we be certain that the world is gonna work a certain way? How can we be certain? And so these kind of beliefs help people to have certainty about what is going to happen. And so this is where there's, there's a way in which to think about this that brings together history, that brings together cultural history, that brings together thinking about conspiracy theory, and we can talk about that as well. But it's also about people who are looking for a sense of purpose in the midst of a very confusing time. The pandemic didn't help. It actually made things worse. People could just stay home and watch all of this. It wasn't that you were normal, in your regular normal church. You might have been watching somebody else. So that there's all these media ecosystems that are filing in 
to make somebody be able to get up and pray like this and get showed on One America Network or Fox News or whatever, and nobody blinks an eye. Nobody questions that this is not true. So that's my 45 minute thing. I'm gonna wrap up here really quick. Let me show you one more thing. Notice that this says Save America, right? Save America tour. This is Charlie Kirk. He was just here a couple of nights ago on Sunday night at Grace Church. This is a large evangelical church here in St. Louis. You can find his whole talk online. I did not know this until uh, a couple of journalists called me and said, I would like to give a quote on this. And I'm like, you're kidding. He was in St. Louis. I might have come early just so I could be in the back of the church, but they probably wrote me out. But Charlie Kirk spoke for an hour and a half. There was a worship service that opened this up. And you don't know who Charlie Kirk is. This Saving America tour is funded by that group there, Turning Point USA. This group came into being in, in part to train young college age people to be able to fight against these kinds of things that they saw in, um, that were happening on college campuses around the country. So they have a very robust system of people all around the country, probably have one here, and they are you know, in part helping people to think about voting Republican or you know, putting professors like me on a professor watch list, which he created that was a big you know, stink for a lot of people or you know, attacking people in the media, right? But Charlie Kirk has started something new. And in addition to all the turning points that he has, and the turning points where they're talking through K through 12 educators about how to change the, the culture of the classroom, he started a Saving America tour back in August that is about preparing and prepping people for the 2022 election and the 2024 election cycle. This is a way to talk about what they thought would be Christian civic engagement. So one of the things that he talks about is how are you going to go talk about this from your, your pulpit? And so there's a lot of ways in which every election cycle we always talk about pastors who say things that they shouldn't say in front of you know, their constituents and their parishioners. And this is like, oh, this is going to trigger the IRS. But he talked about a whole way that you could do this and not have to worry about it. So that was one, of, you know, here are the various steps. You could go this route where you just tell the IRS, I'm doing this and I don't care. You can, you can talk about it this way, or you can be very cagey about it and talk about it this way. But just know that there's no wall of separation. That was that old Dan Barry letter from now, jo Thomas Jefferson is writing back in the day, didn't like Jefferson very much anyway. So you know, let's, let's ignore this. There's, there's no wall of separation. And I was going to say, unfortunately, that I kind of agree with Charlie Kirk. There is no wall of separation. Not in America anymore. It's just all you know, religion and politics all the time but in ways that we didn't expect. So what does all of this mean? It means a lot of things, but it means, number one, that evangelicals are not the evangelicals you used to know. These are people who are, you know, some of them are in good churches and, and poo-poo all of this stuff, but a majority of them believe it, whether we're talking about Southern Baptist Convention people or non-denominational folks or Pentecostals who consider themselves to be evangelicals, they are feeding into different kinds of streams of religion right now. And scholars, and especially journalists, need to pay attention to this. Because if you don't pay attention to all the streams, you will write an article like you did in the New York Times, where you just think this is a nice worship service of people being gassed up for 2022. And I'm like, no, it's not that. It's a lot more. So that's one. Second is that how the media has really influenced all of this and how the talking points are moving back and forth between religious worlds and political worlds. They are seamless now. You don't even see a difference. The, the kind of things that Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley or anybody else says right now, or Marjorie Taylor Greene or anything else, these are things that people are saying in churches. And so there's a very big appeal now for Republicans. It's always been this way, but especially now to come up to these religious places and run things like this in churches, or the thing that happened at Cornerstone Stone with um, General Flynn. So that's second. Third, we have a problem about conspiracy. Part of it is the ways in which we've talked about how Facebook runs and moves, how it picks up the algorithm to show you the exact thing. If you look at one of these things, you're going to get 20 of them the next day, OK? 20 pieces of disinformation. And so it's very hard to escape this. And it's not like what it was when Google first started, where you can tell people, no, that's not real, and this is real. And you would talk to your students about what you could use and what you couldn't use. Now it's like a morass. It's very hard to tell the truth from a lie. It's very tough to do. The other part of this is that we are moving very rapidly into what I will call a theocratic state. How are we supposed to talk about now um, a separation of church and state, an appreciation for other religious groups in this country, freedom of religion, when religious freedom means religious freedom for a certain group of people and not for everybody else. 
that is troubling. That is not what this country has been about. And finally, I think the thing for me that is the most important and why I want to do as many talks like this as I can, not because I think it's great to run around, but because I want to extend a warning. Democracy is in peril. If you didn't know that the day that they broke into 1-6, I'm telling you, you're in trouble. Because it's not just in America, it's everywhere else. Russia and Ukraine is a religious war. We are talking about problems within the Orthodox Church in Russia vis-a-vis -a, -vis a broken off Ukrainian Orthodox Church. If you think about this in, in India, it's about you know, things that are happening between Hindus and Muslims. If you think about Brazil, it's Bolsonaro and his connections to evangelicals. If you think back a little bit further and go back in, in a history that was early 2010s and beyond, if you think about Anders Breivik and Utoya and what happened there on that Norwegian island where he killed over 70 people, that manifesto that he did was all embedded in conspiracy theories and things that he read from evangelicals and religious people here in America. So this is not just an American problem. It's a worldwide problem. It's just that our problem here is that our systems are breaking down, whether we're talking about voting, education, all of those things, and this is changing. And as fast as you can pay attention to everything that's happening around the world right now, it is very difficult to keep up with all these things. And you look up one day, and things are gone. And they're away from you. And you wonder where democracy went. And you didn't appreciate it, because half of the people don't know what civics are after the place. So I want to end with something that um, I finished watching last night in my hotel room. It was a whole series on Ben Franklin. And they're going to say, now you're trying to give a, a, a plug to University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, I am. And the plug is, is that, you know, I walk by Ben Franklin statue every day in front of the College Hall. And there's another Ben Franklin statue on campus, but we won't talk about what students do there, but anybody who's at Penn knows. But um, he had some words to say about the new Constitution. I was really struck by this last night, and I thought I had one ending, and I thought I wanted to say this because I think it's really important. He said two things. He first talked about, you know, when George Washington became the first president. He said, the first man put at the helm will be a good one. No, nobody knows what sort may come afterwards, he said. But that isn't the full quote. What he said after that was this. The executive will always be increasing here, as elsewhere, until it ends in a monarchy. Ben Franklin was really prescient about a lot of things. He's not, you know, it's very hard to get a fix on him because he's such a polyglot in certain kinds of ways. And there are things to admire about him, and there's things not to admire about him. Like, you know, him not seeing his wife for a very long time or having slaves. There, there are things that are problematic. But I think he's prescient. And we are sliding towards that moment where it might just be a monarchy. We had a monarchical family in the White House from 2016 to 2020. They behaved like one. Second thing was, in this story about Elizabeth Powell, who meets Benjamin Franklin and after the new Constitution is done, in his journal, it was only 26 words about this thing that gets really misquoted about if it's a republic, if we can keep it. What he really says is something very different. Powell says to him, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or, some, or a monarchy? He said, a republic if you can keep it. And so the question was about whether this is going to be a republic or a monarchy. These folks want a monarchy. They don't want democracy. They want to be the ones at the helm of everything. And it is embedded in religious belief. And so the question is, is, is this going to happen to us? Are we going to lose what we had before? I'm the last person, trust me, that you would think is going to be sitting here talking and fighting for American democracy. I have had ancestors who are slaves. But I want to tell you here today that if this democracy falls, we are in trouble. We are in big trouble. And so it is incumbent upon whether you're on Zoom listening to this or you're out in the audience or you think I'm just full of it. Think about what this will be if we are a theocracy instead of a democracy and a theocracy run by people who believe in conspiracy theories that profligate at such a rate that it's hard to keep up with them. I'm for democracy. I hope you are too. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'm just going to sit over here. And all you people out there at Zoom land, if you want to yell at me on Twitter, you can, but I won't see it till tomorrow. Don't be shy.
Yes, there's one person up here in the front. And Henry. Um, hi, I'm a, uh, I was a student here a long time ago, and mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in Oklahoma, and I have a lot of evangelical relatives. Yeah. And one or two watch Fox News uh, constantly. That's the only channel they watch. Yeah. But um, uh, my, I, I have an observation that um, you, you invent the truth. You, you, you recast the truth. That, that's what's going on. Uh, and um, and t talking about uh, education, when, when I was in high school, I was very interested in American history. Mm -hmm. But I never learned about the slave Bible until, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. Yeah. So you just invent the truth. It's not what um, uh, the King James Bible came out with. You just rewrite it. So, you know, that's what's going on. And we, yeah. um, human beings have, are very good at reinventing the truth, whether it's Putin or uh, a, a slaveholder in the South. So all, the, all these digital medias, they, they just reinvent the truth. So it's, it's a truth echo chamber. It's a truth bending chamber too. Right. It, so, it's, it's truth bending. So thank you for, uh, you know, your, your uh, lecture tonight and I appreciate it. I'm, I'm just letting you know, I, I do believe democracy is at risk. Thank you. Thanks so much for comments. I think, you know, one of the things I think that has happened to people and I, you know, I was talking to people today saying I wish somebody, I know that there are studies about Fox News and, you know, communications kind of networks. But it's also a way in which people's minds get reimagined, right? Almost rewired in a certain way. They listen to and hear things a certain way. It's also changed discourse too. You know, the ways in which people talk about things or they, they fight about things. You can't have a you know an intellectual argument about something or even just a regular argument about something without it getting really vitriolic. So I think that's part of what has happened too. It's degraded, you know, our conversation. Well, yeah, I'm gonna talk about that, but let me let me say this about about the the Bible piece. I mean, part of this is at the beginning of my book. There's a whole chapter about you know where I kind of line this out from the 19th century viewpoint about how you look at slavery. So there's a clip that happened right when I was writing the book that happened with um, a pastor who was in Atlanta. I talk about this right at the chapter one, and he makes a, he says a phrase that's also part of a slaveholder who also wrote some wrote religion things about slavery, and he says, you know, this benefited white people so much and this was the right thing to do. Or, as I like to talk about, there was another, um, at a religious college in Texas, so you can guess where this is, that the um, Young Republicans group said, uh, slavery was ordained by God and this was not a bad thing because it helped people become Christians. I always tell people in my class, if you say that, you get an automatic F. <laughs> this is automatic, there's, there's no way, if you write this down on an essay or whatever, you wouldn't get an F. You know, and, and that's the problem. So this, this slave Bible is, you're not gonna give people things. I mean, half the time you don't have a lot of slaves who can read in the first place. But you're only gonna say certain kinds of texts. You're gonna talk about Onesimus who comes back to his master. Or you're gonna say slaves are obedient to your masters. So if we, we talk about how, you know, and, and there are other people more qualified than me to talk about this. We talk about biblical criticism that didn't really exist then, right? It comes later. And we talk about the ways in which people interpret the Bible. Well, then you can interpret the story of him and seeing his father's nakedness and say, well, he's cursed. And he's cursed because he's black. And there are people who still believe this. I got a story at the end of the book about this. Who, there's a guy who meets um, a, a very famous black evangelical, Trillia Newbell, and basically tells her, you're not really human. After he and her in a church. Why wouldn't she be human? Well, because she's black. He learned that somewhere in a church unfortunately, because that's the first place you get all this stuff. So this is, this is the carry forward, and I, I talk about this in the book about how, you know, you have people who, you know, you, you talk about the family in a certain way in the 19th century, which carries forward into the 20th, or you talk about, you know, criminals in the 19th century that carries forward into 20th and 21st. These things are all connected. They're not different. And I think this is, this is what we're having. So when you, when you get to Fox News, you know, by the time this, it's not like Tucker Carlson or anybody's like, you know, talking about history. They're, they're talking about certain kinds of talking points and, and certain ways they want you to see the world and to reinforce certain kinds of beliefs. And, you know, when your evangelical friends are listening to it, I guarantee you their pastor is too.
Uh, this is about uh, uh, running into a uh, QAnon person. Mm -hmm. And um, how can one engage or act civilly or be tolerant of uh, one who expresses uh, QAnon views? This is a hard one. And I'm going to tell you why this is hard. Because people who are in this have embedded themselves into something. And so this is not, you know, this is not cult deprogramming that you can do in a day. This is not something, but you can, you can actually start to talk to people, why do you believe this? Well, but this is really like this. You can engage them in a conversation. Now, they may get very mad at you, right? And they, they might not want to receive it, but you have to begin to sort of think about, what are the ways I can poke holes with this with some reality, okay? Even if that's a very simple reality. You know, so for instance, I'm, I'm gonna talk about COVID because I think that's a good one. COVID started off where it was like, you know, this thing came about because it was the 5G towers that everybody put up for the phones. And then it became, you got a chip embedded in you, which is back to the old 1970s stuff about when the barcodes came out, how that was the mark of the beast. And so there's these ways in which these things are repetitive in conspiracy theories. The problem with QAnon is that they are shifting always. So you might talk to a QAnon person last week and they, they tell you a few things, and then this week because there's been a new thing that's been put up on the boards or a new revelation, it's like revelation is happening over and over and over again. So we can talk about revelation in religions, and, and lots of religions have this, you know, Pentecostals do, Mormons believe in it, all this stuff. But these are revelations that come out of certain kinds of ways of being. So there's a way in which, I think it's called gematria, where you can do numbers and, and certain messages that came out. So people would think that when Donald Trump said a certain thing, he really was saying something else. You know? So he might say something about, you know, the Fed did this, and they reinterpret it by doing the numbers to the letters of what he says, and they see something else. So this is what I'm saying to you, it's hard. I mean, the, the things that I've read about people who have come out of it have come out of it because they had a serious event happen or they've had people turn against them or they finally, something triggered them to make them realize that this was not true. It's broken up families. You know, there are people who were at the Dallas thing that they left their family behind. They've gotten divorced. They've sold their stuff. They are following everybody. And so this is where I say to you to be on one hand gentle, but the second hand firm. And to say, well, how do you believe that this is true? How do you know that this is true? Where, where do you see this? How does this work out inside? Do you know that they're not these kind of tunnels under the White House? You know. I, I, wish, I, had, I wish I had a formula for you. I, I would be doing it too. All right, thank you so much for your uh, talk. And for joining us here, um, and welcome back out into the world. Um, many different questions, um, two spring to mind. One is, I agree with you, this is, is really critical and um, really quite scary to hear you and, and, and think about the turn from and the pivot from democracy to the, theocracy. So I'm kind of curious about what you think we can do, um, whether it's confronting people at a micro level individually who hold these beliefs or talking to students in classrooms, what, what do you think we can do to turn the tide and, and spread you know, yeah. truth uh, against that? I think with students, one of the things I think is really important is to be A, patient, and B, here's some material. Here's something to read, come back and talk to me. You, you gotta spend time with people. This is the same thing with the QAnon guy. You gotta spend time with people, because you can't do this, because there's a lot at stake for people, right? You lose a community if you step out of this stuff. And this is comfortable community. I mean, who wouldn't want to be around Charlie Kirk who has a ton of money, you know? And, and you have a, a ready-made community if you were somebody on the outside. You feel together with those people who are there on 1-6. You can talk to each other. You can, you can do all this stuff until you have to start to pay the piper, right? So that's, that's one thing. And the other part of your question was about what can we do on the outside, not just talking about people? I, I think one of the things you can do that is really, really important right now is to, to whatever, you know, where you find yourself politically, is to start writing to your Congress people and everybody else who keeps saying this crap all the time, okay? Because you got people here in the state of Missouri that are just reprehensible. I'm sorry, you do. And I'm sure they'll be talking about me tomorrow. But, you know, this is, this is horrible. And you need, to, you need to also press other leaders who are not into this and say, why are you not doing X? 
Why are you not doing this? You need to get involved in you know, your school board. Listen, there's a template here that is happening. So I'll use school boards as an example to talk about um, masking. People have taken over school boards now to you know, rescind masking orders in, sc in school board things. And people who are just regular school board members have been followed, harassed, spat upon, you know, um, tried to be killed, you know, threatened with their lives. You gotta show up for stuff like this. You cannot take a back seat if you are an engaged member of your community, you got kids or somebody, you need to make sure that you are engaging in the political process. And I'm here to tell you that don't boo vote is not, a, is not enough. It's just not enough, I'm sorry. You know, when Michelle Obama and all of them say all this stuff, I'm like, this is wonderful, but you know what? You gotta be watching the gerrymandering. You have to watch the ways in which voting laws have changed. You need to watch the ways and all this stuff has happened. And you can't just tell people, go wait in line for 12 or 14 hours, go vote. What you need to do is to make sure you're working at a polling place, you're there when you know other people come because they're gonna come, they're organized, they're much more organized than you, got a lot more money. They're gonna be at the polling place trying to threaten people. This has happened in Texas. You know, you get the chicanery like what just happened in Texas with an election in Houston where they said, we don't have enough paper to print out the ballots. So you gotta start calling that stuff out. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, but you gotta pick your battles and figure out what you're gonna do. On this other level, let me talk about this from a religious piece because I think this is really important. Um, you have pastors of all stripes talking like this stuff in, the, in, in, in pulpits across the nation. And I'm not saying this is just a white thing, this is an everybody thing right now, where we have people who are buying into these conspiracy theories and they look like you and I. And you gotta start calling that out. There are some pastors who are just about the money and this is a big money maker. You can make a bunch of money doing this kind of thing because you can sell merchandise, you can get people to give you, you know, a continuing contribution, but you're also being funded by billionaires. So you got all the money in the world. What are you gonna do? What is your pastor saying? What is you know, your religious leader saying? What, where are the ways in which they have embraced these kinds of things? So you hear them you know, endorsing a candidate that is a candidate that is you know, spouting off QAnon kind of stuff. Learn how to hear, and if you hear that, then you have to decide, how am I gonna confront that person? Am I gonna walk away? Am I gonna talk to people in the congregation about it? These are the choices you have. Hi, Dr. Butler. Um, thank you for this uh, stirring talk. Uh, I wondered if you could say a little about how you see the infiltration of these ideas in um, non-white communities. So I know, you know, I, I'm familiar with the PRI statistics. So uh -huh. I knew about the Latino Protestants and how a lot of these theories have have gained traction. I'm mm -hmm. guessing part of it is the is the Pentecostal um, kind of connection. But just generally, I just wonder if you could say more about how you understand that phenomenon and different, I'm gonna guess non-black yeah. communities. Yeah, I, I wanna talk about this with Cheon because Cheon came up in that. Yes, I've been following him, <laughs> yes. Yes. But I don't know anyone who's doing work on him, um, at least scholars. Yeah, well, I kinda do, I have not ever written about him, but I know about him. And I know about him from very long back, back in the 90s. So I know that you know he got involved with Vineyard stuff first, and then, yeah. he, then he went to Toronto Blessing, as you know, if you know anything about him. Then he's kind of been you know, underneath the radar. And then he popped back up, which I thought was really interesting, and started talking about seven mountains and dominionism. And this is how I knew Sarah Palin was getting ready to do something. Because a few months ago, the two of them were together. And they had this big talk, and it was online and everything. I'm like, oh, Cheon and Sarah Palin, here we go. Because most people didn't even know Sarah Palin was in all of this. She was part of a whole group in, in Alaska that were, I, I can't remember the exact name of it, they were Dream Something. And so while she was going to a regular Pentecostal church and then moved into this non-denominational church, Windwalkers, that's what it was. Windwalkers was a, was a prayer group that prayed about spiritual strongholds everywhere. And so one of the women who was in Windwalkers did a prophecy over her. And this is all stuff that's kind of out there, but you have to dig for it a little bit. And they predicted that she was gonna be this person. And so I think this thing that just happened with Cheon where she sort of says, paraphrasing again, that you know, I'd be willing to run, and I'd be willing to do this. This provided the opportunity for her. So 10 minutes before the, the closing, she puts up her stuff. Now, why Cheon? Cheon has a very interesting history and is connected to lots of Asian Americans and connected to other Asians around the world. 
because of the charismatic movement. So these things move, they don't stay static. You can watch anybody from anywhere in the world. You can, you can hear these things and these prophecies and these prophetic kinds of things fall into very well conspiracy theories about Trump and everything else and about how Christians need to take dominion or you need to save America, right? But that's part of all of this stuff. And so when you're a person who is from an ethnic community, you can either feel outside of that camp or you can, you can buy into it as part of your history too. Now, this is where it gets sticky and people may not like this, but I think it's part of the way you buy into whiteness mm -hmm. because you're buying into something that is going to give you power. And what is the clearest thing that can give you power in this particular iteration? Whiteness. So you move into that. So you know where, you, where Trump had Mark Burns and all these guys around him, and you know he had I called it the D list, you know, because I wasn't I didn't know at the beginning what was happening. They, he just had like all these people who I didn't think were very big, like Paula White. They were big in some circles, but not in another. And then they ended up being elevated because he was really smart. He didn't go after the normal kinds of things. Those guys all came around him afterwards, you know, like Franklin Graham and everybody else. He started off with these, you know, neo-Pentecostals and Pentecostals and charismatic people. Mm -hmm. So Cheon's part of that, but it's a kind of unique part of it because those are the people who are more embedded in the Seven Mountains Dominionist theocracy kind of belief, which is does not seem to be on the radar screen of very many people right now, but this language is all over everything. So I don't know if that answered what you wanted to hear, but I know it does. Thank you. You're welcome. You are next. First of all, thanks, Dr. Butler. Good to see you. I have a question about um, what I call situational Christianity. Mm -hmm. So when we see, if we look at uh, President Trump as an, as an okay. example, and some of the um, missteps, to put it lightly, that he took, whether it's uh, outside women outside his marriage or Two things he said about different people, different groups, and so forth, uh, yet people will still eleva uh, elevate mm -hmm. and almost excuse him, well, okay, we know that you've done certain things out of wedlock or had children out of wedlock. We know that you have said, you know, disparaging thing about women, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But mm, that's cool because we'll forget about that. You're an exception. You're mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. ordained by God. Mm -hmm. So what do you attribute to, again, that situation of Christianity? You cool this time, but not on other stuff. And it, Related to that, when we look at the insurrection on January 6th, mm -hmm. just the, the fervor, right? The belief that we are doing this, right? Some of the people who were storming mm -hmm. the wall and so forth. Mm -hmm. What is it that, is it a, a lack of uh, feeling like I'm part of a group? Is it- You trying um, to look for all these fabulous explanations. I got a simple one for you, okay? <laughs> it's morality for, for you, but not for me. And I say that in the book very strongly. And let me tell you why. There's, a, there's kind of a trajectory in evangelicalism. You need to read Kristen Kobes Dumais' book for the other side of this, which is Jesus and John Ray. Because if you read our books together, then I think it gives you a nice picture about why this has happened. One of the things I think is really interesting is that when Donald Trump ascended, there was, a, there was an obvious thing that the press thought. Man, this guy said all this bad stuff. He said everything racist. How can they receive him? It didn't matter. And if you paid attention to something like what Jeff Charlotte discovered in the family, then you realize that God's man does not have to be a, a godly man. He's just God's man doing what God wants him to do. God has anointed him. So it doesn't matter if he's the worst person. You could, you know, there's an easy way to explain this away. Look at David. He was God's man, but he looked at Bathsheba and said, I want her. I'm going to kill her husband. This is biblical. Okay, Hello. This is, a hard, this is the hard part, and then, so you use the word situational Christianity, and I'm not fussing at you, but I wanna bring this up. What situational Christianity? What Christianity? These are Christianities right now. It's not one Christianity, and everybody else is wrong. That's where you mess up, because once you think that there's one way to be, they're always gonna to prove to you that there's not, okay? So this, this way of forgiveness, I think about Ted Haggard. When Ted Haggard messed up, he was the president of National Association of Evangelicals, big church in Colorado Springs. He ended up sleeping with a man. And the way that the man who slept with him found that out was that he saw him on a special, and he was talking about Satan on History Channel, I think it was. And, you know, and this whole thing, he fell apart, and he tried to come back, and they didn't let him come back. That was like, what, the 90s? I'm trying to remember where this was exactly. And then now you had Trump, who had three wives, you know, and three sets of kids, but listen, 
when they came on stage, they were all behaved. This was perfect. It didn't matter. They modeled the family. Didn't matter what kind of family it was. He's rich. He didn't know. He's a baby Christian. That was one of the things that was said about him at the beginning of all this. He's a baby Christian. He doesn't understand this. So there was a lot of latitude for him. And so when you start to talk about how did they pick these figures out, it's because they believe God picked them out. It's because they have some kind of divine imprimatur from God that God put a finger on that man and he became president. And so that was easy for them. And then if you have everybody give you, this person give you what you want, you don't have to worry about what they did that was terrible. And they chose you and you were important rather than the Mexican rapist and everything else that he said, right? So, you, you know, there were these people, the people that I always thought were the most interesting people in the Trump era were the ones who voted for him but they got deported. Because those were people who believed the hype and didn't realize that the law was gonna turn against them. Because they, they thought, you know, surely this is not, does not mean me. I've picked God's man. And then, you know, you end up having your family separated. There were several stories like this. And so I think, you know, when we make these assumptions about Trump or whatever other leader, and you know, where, where you hear the Republicans talk about pedophiles and everything else right now, which is key along talking points. Somebody had a thing on Twitter where it was all the sexual things that had happened with different Congress people. You know, Matt Getz, that's a story right now. There's all these other stories, right? And I think this is really interesting because the same people who are screaming about pedophilia and everything else, I'm like, mm, you might have to deal with your party. So this is, this is where I think we get caught up in going, why are they doing this? That's not the question. The question is, what are they getting? And once you understand it's about what they are gaining and getting in society, instead of why are they looking like they're not Christians, you will understand this a lot better. Because what you just said to me, and this is not wrong, I'm just saying this, it's, it's a thing in which you really believed what evangelicals said. You believed them when they talk about immorality. You believed them when these preachers talked about, you know, I'm pro-life and all this stuff. And then you got these people in the, in the camp giving people abortions. It's called S-I-N, sin. Okay, I don't want to get like, you know, old school Pentecostal in here or, or, you know, or Calvinist, but it's the truth. And so we don't, we try to keep making excuses for this when there's no, there's no excuse. It's what people are doing for power. Once you understand that, it is a lot easier. I know we could keep going, and there were probably more people with questions out there, but uh, we're going to have to call it uh, to a close. Thank you so much to Professor Butler. That was fantastic. And I told you all at the beginning there was going to be a surprise uh, at the end, and that is for anyone who would like a copy of Professor Butler's book, you can receive a complimentary copy per household, per individual, or if there's two of you, uh, for, per couple or per household. Um, out there, and she'll be signing copies as well. Um, I would only say, if you don't mind me saying, she's visiting her parents tomorrow. She's traveling to visit them. So we would ask if you come up to the table to please uh, wear your mask and just and just be uh, just respectful of uh, her space. But um, please, you can get a ticket from one of the students handing them out in the back. Take it out to the uh, cashier at the book table and get a free copy of the book for her to sign, or, or not to sign if you want to take it home. Or you want to give it to one so of your friends. So enjoy the reception, and one round of final thanks to Professor Anthea Butler. And thank you all for coming out. I know it's like a big deal to come out to public things, and I'm really appreciative. And thanks all of you who watched online tonight. <laughs>